Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. Austin Lenny here. I have the uh, pleasure of having Mr. Dan Gandy here. How are you doing, sir? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. You got it, my man. I had the pleasure of coming on y'all's podcast, uh, Real Estate versus Tech. So we know you're in the real estate space, but what I like to do with my guests is I like to allow them to tell their story and start it where they want to. And then we can kind of go from there. So I'll let you kind of take it off from there. Yeah, man. Thank you. I'm really, really glad to be on here. I've been looking forward to it. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, in Canton, Ohio. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the football hall of fame. So, uh, grew up with summers with celebrities coming into the, coming into the town and, uh, shaking things up. And then once the celebrities leave, it's probably not the best place you want to live for the rest of your life. So, um, you know, great place to grow up, but um, you know, no offense to anybody back home, my friends, family and everything. It just wasn't for me. So, uh, I graduated college, uh, with a degree in advertising and I was just like, I got to get out of here. So moved out to the West coast, uh, slept on a couch for, I think, uh, nearly a year in the Silicon Valley. Um, just trying to get my, get my feet into something that I enjoyed. And, uh, that led me to working for a famous landscape architect out of Pebble Beach. And then, so I was always around houses and, you know, crazy luxury properties. And then uh, got recruited to work for a construction company and a real estate developer. And we grew that business to two, three, four million dollars in revenue. And then, um, yeah, man, I was just like, I got to I got to kind of either branch out on my own or, you know, I had that entrepreneur drive, so I didn't know what to do with myself. So uh, I actually switched over to working for uh, Brett Jennings, real estate experts in Las Gatas. Um, And he was just a top producer, man. I learned a lot from him in a very short period of time. And I know I wanted to get into real estate, but I still wasn't sure. Like, you know, I I was a technician in the business or a manager in the business and not a, my own business. Um, but Fast forward like five, 10 years later, I'm a licensed broker. I'm a real estate investor. Um, I also work with Liftoff Agent, tech, technology company. I'm the VP of growth. Help a lot of agents uh, turn on marketing, get them into the digital age, do a lot of positioning. But primary focus lately has just been helping Liftoff Agent grow. And then um, really just my buy and hold investment portfolio and a lot of creative financing. So I love that. And we're going to talk about liftoff agent and other branding stuff, but I, I, interesting. I never asked this question and I don't know why it just popped in my head. Cause I, I live right outside of Austin currently and lived there for nine years. I never lived in Silicon Valley. I've never been there, but, but everybody knows about it. And it was kind of the wild West back in the day, I guess. But, <laughs> but, but what was it like to be around that energy, right? Where that, where there is so much, maybe like a lot of it's false optimism, but it's optimism regardless of that. Right. Like I would imagine that that almost pushes you up against the wall to kind of like be a risk taker, but almost like pave your own way. hundred percent, man. I can't, that move for me was one of the best things that ever happened to me because, you know, growing up in the Midwest, my sister still lives there people don't take a lot of risks. You know, they live, they live, you know, they live two blocks down from their parents, right? They, they stay in the same job for 30 years. It's great. Life is good. But for somebody who is, you know, energetic, always had a passion, was a hustler, always doing multiple things at once. When I got there, it was like sink or swim. And I wasn't, I didn't have a degree in engineering or computer science or whatever. So I watched from 2000, I got there in 2010, from 2010 to 2014, I saw more wealth building happening happening than anywhere else, I would say in the world. Mm -hmm. The real estate market had nearly doubled and uh, about half of my clients in the construction industry were 
technology workers that had or 26, 27 years old driving around Maseratis, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, like success was like the if, if you said California dreaming, it was a Silicon Valley from 2010 to 2020 now. But it it forces you to really you can't there's no I used to say it's the pressure cooker, right? Like you're either gonna cook or you're gonna figure out how to plug in that pressure cooker and be in charge of your life. And that that was a big you know turning point for me. And and now I, I relocated to Eugene, Oregon. But yeah, man, I, I you're would've... you're in a different season in your life and, and same with me. But but something guys, I'm gonna give you the greatest hack. If you're a young real estate agent or business person. I want you to find the two most expensive hotels in the city you live in and do business only from there in the afternoon. And what I mean by that is proximity is power, right? And you know how many guys I've met that are big dudes now that started off caddying at fancy country clubs (laughs) and they were around those guys and they heard business or they just met this dude and you know, I, I truly believe this, right? Because I'm in a different season of my life and so are you because I'm growing businesses. So I need to live where it's cheaper and I can do more. But when you're young, dude, if you don't have something pushing up against you, you're going you're gonna to sink in mediocrity uh, because it doesn't force you to get better. My parents thought I was crazy. I remember like literally the conversation, I'm moving to California, I'm putting my dog in the back seat, and I packed everything and sold everything else. My, my parents were literally like, you're crazy. We don't know what you're doing. And I said, if I don't take these risks, like mm-hmm. I'll never know what my potential in life is. Mm-hmm. And if I wouldn't have done that, it wouldn't shape me to who I am now and being able to run multiple businesses and, and, and be able to handle the stress and, and the adversity. So. <laughs> And on, an, and on an investor side, because I would venture to say I've had a lot of multifamily guys, mm-hmm. had a lot of flippers, a lot of wholesalers, a lot of Airbnb guys. It's not often that you hear somebody say, well, I'm a buy and hold investor. Um, it's not as sexy, right, when you say it out loud. But is that kind of the tactic that you found that suits good with like who you are and what your goals are and, and you're comfortable and your strategy? Yeah. As a marketing consultant, I get bombarded by flippers. So I've worked with a lot of house flippers. Uh, A lot of house flippers come to me for marketing advice. And the commonality to this, I'll give you this kind of statistic, is that in even on our our local Oregon Real Estate Investors Association, there's probably like 150 members. And of the 150 members, 15 really have a, a flipping business. And of those 15, about five of them do more than one or two flips at a time. And there's a few, like I have a, a buddy, Rick, who's done over a hundred flips and he's an, he's kind of a, uh, an anomaly to the, the, the current trend, but house flipping is kind of like, uh, I always tell everybody there's, there's these stages or the progression of a career of an investor. And, and usually it starts wholesaling, house flipping, and then uh, from house flipping to maybe doing some new construction or multifamily and then maybe holding some rentals once they've had some cash flow and they've been able to build some stuff. And then from there, it's like syndication. And from syndication, then it's note holding and selling notes and being being a top dog where you can just buy and sell properties and owner finance everywhere. But part of me and my part, my business partner's plan with all of this was we knew that the there you with your house flipper, you have one exit strategy. It's sell the property. Mm-hmm. But when we go into a real estate deal, being a broker or an investor, I can look at this from like three or four or five different exit strategies. I can buy a property and and I can hold it into my own portfolio. I can buy it on owner financing. I can subject to it. Um, or, or I can list your property. I can do an off-market deal. And what I really got in all of this is that I was taught early on that cash flow is king. We've all heard that. But how do you take the most minimal cash on cash return and start to build a portfolio? And I've been actively a hold investor for uh, probably 24 months. Now I'm at 13 doors. Okay. And I'm trying to get to, I want to get to 50 in the next couple of years. And then Mm -hmm. my goal, I'm 30, I'm going to be 37 this year. At 50, I want to have a hundred doors. Okay. 
And that's, that's just been my goal. And it can be a mix of all different types of property. And so. it's, inter- it's interesting because I'm, I'm a firm believer that you have to try. Cause I have, I flipped, I, you know, one flip and I've done Airbnb at a large scale and I bought, I have buy and holds right now, but like, you know, I coach a lot of people and, you know, I think my big thing that I rail against right now is that you haven't determined the lifestyle that you want to create to match the investing that you want to do. You've seen something and you're like, well, I'm going to do that. But what you don't know about Airbnb is it's going to take over your life. And so (laughs) If you, and this is what I, what did I rail against? If you have a great job and it's paying your insurance and you can part with 50 to 60 to hundred K and you can put it in a syndicated deal with somebody that you trust and they never bother you. That sounds way more appetizing to me than buying five single family homes when you're a high powered doctor. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm like, you got to get clear on what you need because investments sound sexy, but you have to see how much time it's going to take away from you. Yeah, no, it's, and that's when I, when I worked with uh, several syndicators, I, I, you know, it's, it's not my initial, you know, protocol of what I want to do just because I've seen, I've seen the good, bad and the ugly of syndication, you know, like, Hey, you're not hitting the returns or what's going on here or litigation. And, all those different things that can, you know, turn syndication kind of upside down or you lose your investor pool. But, um, you know, me and my business partner have been really focused on creative financing. Um, I'm about to do a seminar on owner financing to the Oregon Rental Owners Association. It's like, you know, they have like 3,000, 5,000 members of some of the biggest investors that hold multiple properties. And I think uh, when you create an investment business around helping people and solving their problems, not just selling, right? Not just buying, but really helping them get to where they want to go either via wealth or get, get to where they need to go via fixing their problems. If it's probate, divorce, uh, downsizing, you know, consolidation, liquidation, that's been really what's been the, the great marketing and really good problem solving has allowed us to focus on holding properties. And like, let, let me be clear here, guys. I started with $5,000. I own million, like we, we own, we'll probably own close to $3 million in properties here mm-hmm. in the next three months. Mm-hmm. So when people say like, you can't do it or it's, it's, you know, you got to go flip houses to make sure you can, you know, cash flow and all this different, like, no, it's, it's, Dude, it's really tough. Of all the people, you're going to love this. So there's a girl in my area. She's an agent, a wholesaler, a bunch of different things. Yeah. I interviewed her last week. She told me this story. This is, this is like, <laughs> you'll give this to your people at your thing. $60,000 property in Waco, Texas. The guy says, I want cash. She says, no. And then he says, look, I don't need money. And she goes, well, I can't get a loan for that. So do you want to find owner finances me? He says, sounds great. So the owner finances it to her for 5,000 down, 60 grand. She, she cleans the property out, sells it to another investor, 90,000, 10 K down on a wraparound note. And then she got a wait for it. She got a loan uh, transaction person to handle the payments between the wraparound note and the owner. And she's paying the 25 bucks a month. So she made $5,000 on the deal and then she's cash flowing 400 bucks a month and she doesn't control anything in the property. It's, it's amazing. It's that's, those are the success stories that, you know, a lot of our investor friends will always come to me and my business partner, my business partner, he's, he's been, you know, really good friends for the last four or five years. And we decided to partner up. He had great credibility. He owns his own whole portfolio, but mm-hmm. everyone was always coming to Ed and saying, Hey, can you help me solve this problem? Like, I don't know how to get out of this deal yeah. or I'm in a sticky situation here. And, uh, j- just like the example you said, we had a, we had a guy last year reach out to us. It was actually a referral from one of our, one of our really good friends, realtors. We have, we have, a. let me just be on, I'm a realtor, but I have three or four realtors in my local market who send me deals like all the time. They'll go out to a listing presentation and, and they'll call me and be like, you just need to talk to these guys. Mm-hmm. And in that relationship, there was a guy that was trying to get out of his, his parents had uh, given him like three acres with two investment properties on it. 
he was renting one out. The other one was vacant. He didn't want to do any work. He didn't want to do any rehab work. And he was like, listen, listen guys, like I just want, I want X amount of dollars for it. And we're like, it's just not going to happen. It, it doesn't, the income doesn't constitute the purchase price that you're trying to get. And I said, you know, what do you need? And he said a thousand bucks a month. He goes, if I had a thousand dollars a month, I would, I would be happy. And I said, no landlord and a thousand dollars a month are the two problems that we need to solve. He goes, yeah. I said, I'll buy it for this. I'll give you this much down and I'll get, I'll promise you a thousand dollars a month for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we purchased that property. We rehabbed it. I got two renters in it. I actually subdivided the, the land, the first two acres. I leased it out on a second lease. So now I got three tenants and I increased the, the, basically the net operating income and the purchase value. So I made about a hundred thousand dollars in six months. Mm -hmm. And those types of deals, like if he, most investors would have gone out there and been like, what do you want for it? And they're like, I want this. And they would be like, I can't give it to you. And they would got back in their car and drove away. That's I had, I have a, uh, I have a good, good friend that um, a mentor that has like five different businesses in the real estate business. He's a broker. He's a wholesaler, flipper, all the things. And he says, the default is you're the agent. He says, you walk in as an investor and you explore every option. And then you say, if you have a price I can't buy, well, then I can list it for you. And he says, he can't tell you how many deals he's got by, because if you walk in as an agent first only, right, then you've cut yourself off to the possibilities that are available and you left a lot of money on the table because you're trying to take the easy road out. And that's, that's what I, that's really what I learned from, you know, working with the, one of the top brokers in, in California was he was doing development. He was doing some flips and he always said like, you're here to solve their problem and having that license and be able to purchase it or be able to do an off market deal or do something mm -hmm. creative. When you have all of those tools in your tool belt, now you're never, that leads not leaving anywhere. Like you, mm -hmm you're creating that value and you're going to be able to help them. And that's really why I focused on really studying creative financing, studying the, the marketing side of real estate, because this business is like 95% lead generation and 5% real estate. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, the, like, because, because ultimately right on a bigger scale, if you're looking at it from a, from a mindset, meaning global market, the, in essence, the market dictates how quick the house is going to sell, right? There, yes, don't get me wrong. You can do great photos and great staging, and you can be a great agent that knows everybody. But ultimately, that's why I have an issue because I coach a lot of agents. That's why I have an issue right now that everybody's puffing out their chest. Like, dude, I could get my, I could get a goat out from our farm and sell some real estate right now. There's 26 offers on a house, yeah. but. That being said, I do, I do think that I have a friend in Austin. He's going to do 52 transactions this year. And you know how much money he spent on marketing? Zero. Because of his, you know, who he is, it's all referrals. So once you get the referral machine going, it, it really is the how quick your property moves is dictated on the market. And I don't think that's what people pay attention to enough. I, I was talking to Ricky Carruth, big real estate coach. Um, a couple of weeks back and, and I was telling him on the phone, I said, I said, you know, getting to that referral base where you don't have to prospect anymore, your marketing costs can be, you know, downsized. Let's call them that. And I said, that's great. But as a real estate agent, when are you really going to retire? And, and if you run your business off of referral, I, I hear it all the time in the technology sector, when we sell websites and funnels and all that type of stuff from the marketing side. I hear agents say, I work off referral only. I don't need a website. Like I have a big database. It's cool. Everything's great. I say, when are you going to retire? It's the uh, first question I always ask. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, you're not creating a business that allows passive lead gen yep. so that you can essentially refer them all out to your buyer's agents or your referral partners. And you can sit on the golf course and just pick up your phone and connect the dots and make 25% mm. of the commission. To be a rainmaker in your business is is not bragging about how much money you don't spend on marketing. It's it's really talking about how much time and freedom you have because you're not tied to that database. You're not tied to those referrals. 
You can run your business. And that's what I really learned from Lars Hedenberg at B School in North Carolina, one of the top agents. He he taught how do you run your business and be there one or two days a week? Because if you're not, you're going to work seven days a week and you're going to make all this money, but your wife's going to hate you. Your kids are never going to see you and you're never going to go on vacation and enjoy your life. That That's next. It's yeah. next. So it, I don't know why I have this. I don't know why I have this dream, but I've had it my whole life. And I, I don't know. It's because I grew up on a golf course. But something I've always been stuck in my heart is I search and seek the ability to make money when I'm on the golf course. Like that's, that's what's always in my brain. So like I look at, I look at the coaching, which is a great business for me and I love it. It's my passion, but I'm only one person. And in order for me to truly make money, even though it might be a good dollar per hour, I still have to be there. (laughs) And so I am over the next couple of years creating products, right? Whether that be online summits or courses or, or a book or so, whatever that allow me to make money as my marketing coach would say, uh, when you're in the air in a plane, yes. right? And, and, and I think that's what you're alluding to, correct? Yeah. I mean, I have, uh, I've been actively recruiting a general contractor to kind of take over our flip division for the investments. And Really, I didn't want to bounce around between a million contractors or be at the whim of their availability. And, and I jumped on a call with my general contractor, that really young young buck guy knows his stuff. And he said, hey, man, like, do you have a project right now or should I go out and look for some business? And, and I was like, if you're going to swing your hammer in your business, you're not running your business. I said, you need to be able to have a project manager and be able to coordinate and play general. This is an army. And you're a general contractor, you're a general in your business. And I and I get it. You got to run your business and you got to make make a paycheck and, and put food on the table. But Dude. you need to work on your business, not work in your yeah. business. Dude, I have a I have a friend. I won't give out his name and I won't share his <laughs> business plan, but I can at least share this. He told me it's okay. He's a big contractor up in NorCal. Okay. He has not swung a hammer in four years. He's basically like Uber and he knows, he knows everybody and he does like five to 15 million a year and he has not left his house. Like he's all like subs it out because he can get the deals because guys think about it. How many good carpenters and plumbers do you know that are the best, but they can't get business to save their life or they don't know how to run a business. Right. And so if you're the guy that can connect the dots, which is me, I can connect the dots for people and certain things so quickly you know, you have to understand how to monetize that and understand that for me, w- before COVID hit, we had a 50 room shipping container hotel that we were doing for a client. Right. And I got on the phone call with this guy who has like four businesses and he's like, Austin, this sounds great. He said, but you are literally writing your death sentence. He goes, the, the way this is business out, you're going to be stuck there for the rest of your life. And then you're not going to be able to chase any other opportunities. He said, so if it were me, I would take way less and leverage yourself out of it and see the bigger picture because the next three projects, then you could get a percentage of ownership. And, and that's what changed my entire life was to, to look at it from a bigger scale. Yeah, that's, that's uh, and I think we're all guilty of making that mistake at first, right? Because you, you want to learn the trade or whatever, master what you're doing. And I think when it comes down to creating the life you want to live. Like we see, I have a lot of investor friends and people that, you know, make a lot of money and life's great. They drive a great car. They have a big house. And at the end of the day, they work seven days a week and they're slaving. Like, and I'm always like, they're always like, Dan, like you work a lot, but like, you know, why are you, how do you do everything you're doing? And I said, cause everything I do, I try to make sure that I can either, you know, what's the word automate, delegate, eliminate. And if I can't automate it, like I'm going to figure out some way to delegate it. And if I can't, I'm going to eliminate it or I'm going to focus on bringing in a profit partner. So let me just touch base on this real quick. I would rather have 10% of a hundred things than a hundred percent of 10 things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've really been focusing on and me and my business partner have is bringing in partners And giving them, say, 25% of the deal or 75% of the deal, but eliminating my either capital investment or eliminating my bandwidth and time from it. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and being able to orchestrate it, connect the dots, create the system and saying, Hey, go find more. I'll give you more. Mm -hmm. You can use my tools. You can piggyback anywhere you can. And it, that stems from the Silicon Valley. Yeah. Because I saw so many small startups, engineers. It's not just the CEO that owns a hundred percent. Like it's 10 people that all own 10% of the business. And now they're all billionaires. Yeah. Do you, and do you like, you like barbecue? I love it. Okay. You ever heard of Aaron Franklin? This is all going to come full circle. So he's, no, so okay. I would say he's, He's on Netflix. I mean, it's probably rated best barbecue in the country. Like I'm, I'm dead serious. Started out with one brisket, now does like 180 a day. Like, right? Like sells out in a couple hours. But guys, he's a prisoner. He's created a vehicle that forces him to create the brisket. And only him can do that because he's the best. So he's actually created his own walls. And... Yeah. And I used to do that. And so every time I look at a business, like there's certain things that I can do that others can't. I've got 22 years of networking. I can bring in buyers left and right for any, for any build. Well, guess what? You know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to go search for properties. I just don't care. I'm too busy. I, I don't want to do it. I'd rather travel. But there's younger dudes that want to and are hungry. And so I'd rather give them 40, 30% of the business and see the bigger picture, but then I just do what I do and then everybody wins. You you just hit the nail on the head. This last year, in the last 90 days, the last 180 days, I started a, a, a real estate informant program. Mm -hmm. I call it the, the REIP, R-E-I-P. Okay. And that was to mentor four or five really energetic people who wanna learn about real estate. They wanna take some of my bandwidth and time but in, in, in return, go drive, go drive for dollars, go, go network with people, go look for what we're looking for and create it, create the database and create, create the system around finding those properties, getting a picture on it, skip tracing it, finalizing all that contact information, and then plugging it into the marketing system and being able to create that dialogue and the scripts. And really what that's done is, I have uh, eventually these four or five people, maybe three of them are going to become employees of the investment business. Mm -hmm. And I tell them like, you can go to college for this stuff. I got two or three of them that are in college for computer engineering. Uh, one's a medical sales guy who sells like pacemakers and heart stints. Like guy makes a lot of money, but their, their dream and vision is to work in real estate investments. And, I, and they said, how can I trade? How can I not pay you? I don't want to sell coaching. And, and it's nothing against coaching. It's just, it takes time and bandwidth. Yeah. So how can I mentor them with the time that I do have and then create that, that REAP program where they're, if they go find that deal, they're, they're a joint venture in that deal. Mm -hmm. And that's really been, it's been super successful for us from all different aspects. They brought us a nine unit apartment complex. You know, I just got two more properties yesterday that came in. So what I tell everybody is be careful how you treat everybody because you might you don't know who the next Mark Zuckerberg is going to be. <laughs> exactly. And and what I'm saying is I'm I'm seeing it with a young like perfect example. I got a guy out of L.A. friend of mine, biggest off market multifamily broker in the country. One of them, dude's a monster. Sixty hundred thirty million dollar deals. He said I was the guy that was making the phone calls, the cold calls. He goes, so if anybody brings me a deal, I hook him up with fifty percent. He goes, because they brought the value and then I brought the buyer. And so, you know, that's why, like, I, I try to tell everybody that I meet, especially the young kids, is like legacy, like legacy. You've got 60, 50 years of business and you can sully a name really quickly. And so, you know, I, I tell everybody, like, be careful when you're trying to squeeze the juice out of this dollar bill like that you don't see the bigger picture and you're going to, you're going to turn yourself off to the bigger play. And, and that's what it's really hard to understand sometimes when you, when you want the money, right. Or what, more importantly, pardon me, when you use the money to validate your success. Yeah. And this, like, we all know this, like this business, when I first got in this business, I was like sickening. I was sickened about the egos in real mm -hmm. estate. 
Like I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this. Like everyone's a hot shot. Everyone's doing these seminars and and everyone wants to be the rainmaker and, you know, working for some of the top minds in the country and being able to understand that there's ego, but there's also a lot of good people here that want to help people. And like you said, like, if you can, if you can provide, you lead with value, right? I think that's the number one lesson I want to share with everybody is that people reach out to me and I don't send them an invoice. You know, I try to help them. I, 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 I'm looking for that referral or I'm looking for that, that help, but if it doesn't come, it doesn't come. And I think that's what helped me and my business partner really scale our business is that we even had realtors reaching out to us like, Hey man, can you help me with my marketing? Or I want to do, I want to start farming. And they're like in the exact same part of my own city where I'm farming. And I'm like, you know what, if you're going to do this, what do they say? Like you can tell 99 people what to do, but 1% of them are going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's, it, you know, we talked about last night with my buddy who owns a couple businesses. He's a big broker and investor here. Like, I just started doing it because I'm so over it. I've started compiling a list of everything that's free that's available. And anytime somebody complains about there's no, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that. I'm just going to give them the list of all the free things that are available. Like it's never, dude, I swear to you, dude, I meet on a daily basis, 18 year olds that are already wholesaling or flipping. And I'm like, if I knew, like if I knew back then, if I could get my pants on right, like these kids can be retired in three years. Like that's real. There's so much available on YouTube. These podcasts, I mean, there's so much available. If you're if you're open and you're humble, when you show up with a great attitude, it's all available. Because because the amount of bandwidth that you have available is almost next to none. But if you show like if you provided me value like like a young kid i'm gonna give you like a lot of things like you know and that's what i tell my assistant all the time like like just just you just trust me i look you might not see the vision but i got it and and trust me we're going where we need to go and when i get there i'm gonna reward you handsomely you know it's i think that there's two things you brought up, like that loyalty and being able to trust a mentor and be able to, a lot of it's alluded by, you know, I have to pay for this or I have to find my own coach and, or, and I have to buy a bunch of books and teach myself. You, you still got to do those things. But what I see in the younger generation and exactly what you said is that when I was 18 years old, I had no clue I wanted to do. So I, what did I, let, let me be honest from 18 to 25, I just partied and went to school. Yep. That's it. Like it's, it's pretty much a blur. Like it, it was fun. It was great. I learned a lot, but if I would have started at 18 and had like something that I niched down on, if it'd been real estate, I don't know where I'd be, you know, now at 30, 35, 36. And I think, I think there's a lot of people out there, the younger generation that they see the fast money, but they don't realize like with real estate, you got to educate yourself. You got to be a constant learner. And if, if you can find a really great mentor and provide loyalty to them, help mm-hmm. them. You're not going to get rich overnight, but what you will learn from that is that in three, four or five years, you're going to be way ahead of everybody else that's starting out. And that's hard to, it's hard to digest when you're young. Cause you want to go from zero to 120. Mm-hmm. Like that's your mentality. And I think no, 100%. that's how I learned the hard way. I, I just really, I, I thought I wanted to do zero to 120 and then I had to take I had to go scale back to about 75 for four or five years and then got married, had a kid. And now I'm like, all right, I'm back to 120. Yeah, hundred so. percent. And so I want to spend the back half of the podcast because a lot of my coaching clients are maybe new real estate agents or in the next week or two, they're going to be real estate agents. I actually had a phone call with, with uh, your business partner yesterday, uh, Norman. Norman, my favorite guy in the world. Uh, we're, we're, we're cooking up some, some big stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll keep you, uh, we'll keep you abreast of that crazy thing he's planning down there in Arizona. But, uh, the, the world and, and I, even me in my business, right. The world of marketing is full of a lot of smoke and mirrors, right? Because the metrics of how to understand if it's making a difference or something like that is very hard. But I've been playing around with ads recently on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook just to mess around, just to see stuff. And 
tell me if I'm wrong or right. I realized that one of the joys of paying for ads is to be able to retrieve the data to actually know what the hell's going on. And, it, and I don't mean by likes. I mean like by metrics of like how old they are, how long they watch. Isn't that half the battle? Isn't that the reason that you actually spend money on marketing somewhat? Yeah, I think it's, um, I just had this conversation yesterday with uh, a, a gentleman who's a financial advisor and we, he was setting his one page marketing plan. And I said, Hey man, do you have an Excel spreadsheet that kind of goes through, this is how many phone calls I make to set this many appointments to, uh, to close this many deals. And do you have like, how much direct mail do I send? It costs X amount of dollars. And how many appointments do I get from it? How many points, how, how many appointments are set? How many appointments are met? How many deals are closed? What's that return on investment analysis? And I think in the real estate space, like you just said, is people will throw wet paper towels against the wall and something will start working and they'll just start raking in commission checks. And at the end of the day, like I, one of the key questions I ask when a new client comes in is I say, when are you going to retire? And do you track your return on investment per lead source? And 90% say no. And what you're alluding to is that in order to double down, triple down, quadruple down, trim the fat, be able to test, A-B test between what's working, what type of ads should I be focusing on? Is that target market responsive to this or are they not responsive to this? It can't be, it can't be chicken scratch on a notebook. It's got to be a very disciplined Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets that you can extract that data and those metrics because you're paying for, like you just said, you're paying for not only performance, but you're paying to see what type of result is constituting what type of, what type of reward. And I think that's the hardest thing, especially with social media and YouTube. Those are the two things that I always tell real estate agents. This is a long-term play. You're going to put five, 10, 15, $20,000 into video editing and, and the time uploading and, you know, creating a script and having a content calendar. And at the end of the day, you might be one to two to three years into this. And I just got off a podcast literally an hour ago with this guy named Daniel J. Hunter. He's in Dallas, Texas. You should have him on your podcast. The I, guy, please introduce me. I'm all, I'm, I'm all <laughs> he's, he's in Texas. We're good. So yeah, he's in, I think he's in Frisco. So oh, my, with the best city, one of the best cities in Texas. So yes. Yeah. And he was on our podcast this morning and he said, Hey man, I'm, I'm sacrificing deal conversion and deal volume to double down, triple down on my YouTube. Dude, I have a friend. Seriously. I will not say his name. He thinks between the salary from his marketing manager and the money they spent in the last five years, he spent $250,000 on YouTube and they're nowhere they want to be. But I learned this from traffic secrets, uh, which I love that book. YouTube is the one channel that for the rest of your life, it will be there. It's evergreen it, marketing. Evergreen marketing, right? I had to ask my buddy who's a high-end marketer what this meant because I didn't understand it. Yeah. Uh, and for me, YouTube is the hardest thing. I, it's the one thing I haven't focused on yet. It's going to be the thing I move into the next year. Yeah. But, but, you know, Instagram, Facebook, it gets caught in your feed. It goes down. And, and so people are like, why would you do that? Well, because first of all, the, the investment money that you can spend on YouTube makes sense right now for the amount of views and traffic you get. But more importantly, it just stays there. And so, you know, like if you have an actual conversion, right, to get their information, then you can, then you can really leverage the, the trigger, I guess you would say. And, and that's why people don't get it if you're not seeing it now. Because what Gary Vee talks about this all the time. You basically have your own TV show uh, at your fingertips, which is unheard of from anywhere. Like that's you. It's amazing. That's been the the biggest thing, you know. Content stacking. Um, you know, I, I have, from my investor side, I have a carrot website. Uh, shout out to Trevor Mouch and all. Yes, guys. my my mentor is like in his men's. They're in their mastermind together. I've heard great things about him. So yeah, good, great company. And and at the end of the day. It, 
the the content stacking. So if you're going to shoot a video and you're going to post it on social media and it's going to be housed in your YouTube channel and, and you send out an email marketing newsletter for the week and you you create that system of being able to use that multimedia, that content you created and being able to use it in all different spots, but then take it and throw it behind you in your little YouTube library. And now you have your little encyclopedia of everything you've ever talked about and mm -hmm. you can reuse it, repromote it. You can run ad dollars and retargeting sequences behind it. But I think the, the point I really wanted to get to is that it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, it doesn't matter if you own a, a car repair shop. It doesn't matter if you're a landscaper driving around and mowing lawns. If you can create value and you can create a YouTube channel that has that authority and that expertise, people are going to see it. It's not going anywhere. And you may even start to monetize it. The guy I just had on the podcast was like, yeah, man, I'm starting to get checks for four or $500 a month. He's like, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of money, but it paid for my video editing for last week. So Amazing. it's good stuff. I think that's this. Because, because no longer, right. Have we created uh, restrictions up against, you know, I think, uh, God, who was talking about this? Uh, Gary V was talking to Tom, Be Tom Bellew about like, Dude, to have this interview, you know, 10 years ago would have cost $100,000. You know, we're doing this for like $20, right? And <laughs> like right now, like I have a laptop and a light and a microphone. And it's like, I, I interviewed a guy in Ireland the other day. It's like, whatever you want to do is available. But like one of the things I love, and I tell all my young kids, because I'm on them to, to do social media. Well, I don't know what I'm going to post about. Well, document, don't create, just document, like create. And then you take the 20, 30 minute video and you break it into three or four minute videos. And then you have content for the week. Like it's not as, you know, for me, that was, that was, I don't know if you ever felt this way, but when I started a podcast, I was like, oh my God, I don't even know how I'm going to get guests. And I'm now I have too many. I'm like, <laughs> like I had to release 30 episodes this month because I've got too many backlogged, you know? And it's like, now people are coming out of the woodwork. And so, you know, those limiting beliefs that you have on, because one of the things I heard last week was if you have one follower, you're an influencer. Yeah. <laughs> it's spot on. Like me and Norman started the real estate versus technology podcast. I think about a year, year and a half ago. And, and like, I was, ho I was getting on Norm and I was like, Hey man, we need a podcast. He's like, everyone has a podcast. It's cliche. And I was like, but we, we, me and you have a lot of knowledge. We've worked in the real estate business. We've worked with a lot of top producers, top 1% in the country, like high volume, super mastermind expertise, mm -hmm. everything, yada, yada, yada. It's not something to brag about. We need to be able to share that mm -hmm. and get that message out. And uh, you know, the first few are rough. And I, I tell that with anybody, it's if you can shoot one video a month, you have 12 a year. If you can do two, two a month, you have 24 a year. Imagine if you're doing one a week, you got over 50 a year. Mm -hmm. And it, that's where, that's where the, the Instagram was Instagram because it was pictures. Mm -hmm. Now Instagram is video and reels and stories and multimedia. You can't, you can't deny that trend. And that's, that's marketing. It's, it's the it's, evolution. It's, do you know who, I don't know. I'm not going to say I can get him, but there's no chance for y'all show, but he would destroy. Uh, have you ever heard of a guy named Christopher Lockhead? No, no. Okay. So he's one of my mentors, mentors. He is the, OG and I mean OG like he is the original dude in Silicon Valley uh exited at 4.5 billion dollars like lead Ooh. marketing of a he's I think he oversees like 40 companies drinks a ton of whiskey talks shit about uh, everybody uh Grant Cardone and Gary V he talks shit about everybody because he thinks they've created this whole hustle culture that destroys people and he can't stand it because he said there's a way to operate but he talks shit on marketers all the time, right? He's got a great podcast, one number one podcast in the country. And he talks about like that the, the marketing and the sales guys never sit in the same room. Yeah. And, and, and how, and so think about it in your own business guys, you 
can't operate and promote the way that you want to do it. You have to understand that LinkedIn's a little more professional. Instagram's kind of funny that you can do some weird stuff. TikTok's out of its mind. We don't know what's going on over there. Yep. And then Facebook is more of like where realtors do business. If you just go into it willy nilly and you don't understand who's looking at your stuff or the data, then what are you doing? You're just like you said, you're just, as I would say here down in Texas, Dan, you're just pissing in the wind. <laughs> no, it's I learned that, uh, you know, of the things I did learn in college, you know, that. I think college, let's back up. Education in general is, I never tell anybody that education is bad, right? It's, it's part of the foundation of life. That's why you go to preschool, elementary, and high school, right? When you get to college, what you learn in college is responsibility, is problem solving, is how to be an adult, right? But there's other things that you don't, they don't teach you that, you know, applying to life, that experience, like somebody that wants to be a journeyman electrician and doesn't go to school, they may be really intelligent, but they didn't, they didn't learn those same skills. Well, what you're talking about is when I was in college, I had this professor, uh, his name was, uh, I'm going to butcher this. I think his name was William Barr, Bill Barr. He did remember pork and beans. Mm -hmm. Um, he did like the original pork and beans advertising. Um, he had all these crazy, crazy different stories and yada, yada, yada. But, uh, you know, one of the reasons me and Norman really went to positioning agents and being a positioning agency. So if you don't know what positioning is, it's what people in your market think when you think real estate agent, it's this person. They are filling a position in your mind. It, when you think Coca-Cola, you think uh, dryer sheets or Tide or whatever it is, right? There's always that one or two products. So, so here's a perfect example for my space. Airbnb repositioned themselves. People no longer said vacation rentals. They said Airbnb. Yep, exactly. Yep. And so William Barr has this conversation with everybody and he's talking about positioning. And this guy's super successful. He's like retired and, you know, one of those, one of those uh, more successful people that you would see that come back to college to share the knowledge just because they're good people. And He's telling me, he goes, any business, it doesn't matter what business it is, in your local market, in order to have top of mind awareness, to have market share, to have reach and frequency with your target markets, the people you want to do business with, you have to be positioned in their brain to either be the phone number in their cell phone or the person they think of anytime somebody says mechanic or luxury agent. You have to position yourself in that market and be that person and be, be not even so much niche down or be an expert, but you have to have the authority in that area where people know you're the go-to person. And I, I want to really say this, that that stuck with me because then I realized like you could do a bunch of marketing, you could generate a lot of leads, you could close a lot of deals and grow a company. But if there's three or four, say there's three or four car dealerships in town and everyone knows that your dealership is the most honest, they have the best inventory, they're willing to negotiate and work deals, people know you as the best dealership. And growing up, I had a, I had a friend that owned like eight or nine dealerships, same name, but different Ford, Hyundai, yada, yada, yada. And he always, I always say like, why are you guys so successful other than the fact that you have so many dealerships? And he'd say, because people know that we're not, we're not in business to just tell them like, nope, can't do this price. They, we, we're the ones in towns that will negotiate. And they, they have built a business based upon negotiating and being open to it. And I don't want to go in the weeds because I could talk nine years about this, but there's a, there's a concept around society Lately, whether it be Walmart with Amazon prices, that people act like people don't pay for value. And that's that's horse shit, because ultimately, if, if I'm going to and I don't want to go in the weeds, but if you charge too little, people actually might not see the value in it. I know that sounds crazy to say, but in the coaching business, there is like either they're bought in or they're not. And sometimes you have to charge more to get their attention. Like, and that's why I feel like 
that's why I feel like people don't take advantage of all the free information out there because it's, they're not they're not paying for it. So they it loses its luster and value to them, and they don't see the need for it. Yeah, we get that. We get that in just even in sales. Like you set an appointment with somebody, you put something on your calendar, you sacrifice other people's time slot, and at the end of the day, they no call, no show. Yeah. Right there. Like, wonder if I, Austin, I just didn't show up to your podcast and you're like, what the hell, man? Like yeah. it's six weeks booked out and I, I'm all, <laughs> like, I got prepared and I knew who my guest was and I set up everything and then now you're not here. Yeah. And we, it's, ha- we, it's happened. It's happened. It, it happens it, in every season. Yeah. And it, it, it's really alarming to me, but, but, but then my coach had to explain to me, like they're, they're just not invested in the, in the idea of it because they haven't parted with any money. And so you know, there's a rub there, but you know, I want to respect your time. I know you're super busy for people to find the podcast and, and the, and the website and all that stuff. How do they find all that stuff? Yeah. If you go to www.liftoffagent.com, uh, you can go to our resources tab. It has uh, real estate versus technology podcast. You can actually book a, a podcast, I believe, or send an email there. Um, if you're a real estate broker, real estate investor, uh, title agent, anybody in, in the space, right? Love to have you on the podcast. Um, as well as uh, if you live in the Eugene Springfield or anywhere in Oregon, or you're outside of Oregon, uh, you can hit me up on Instagram. I'm the Oregon relocation expert. Uh, I'm a realtor, broker, and happy to entertain any of your referrals, take care of them. I usually only do one to two deals at a time and, and make sure my service is impeccable. So uh, yeah, man, that's that's what that's what we got going on. So I love it. Well, guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends, share it with somebody that could get some value from that. And uh, we appreciate you so much, my man. Awesome. Appreciate me having on me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.